Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, tonight, I'm continuing in the study of the book of Job. And tonight, we're going to begin with chapter 39. If you have not seen the study of the first 38 chapters, uh, I hope you will go back uh, and watch this from the beginning. Uh, those episodes are already uploaded on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. And so, but before I get started with the study tonight, I, I don't want to forget to, to ask everybody to please, uh, tonight, tomorrow, especially, please pray for uh, Brother Evan's wife, Sharon. Evan is known on YouTube as Nephilim Free. Please pray for his wife, Sharon. She will be having surgery uh, tomorrow, which is Tuesday. And it's very serious. So please, let's all join together and, and, and pray for this successful surgery and a, a complete recovery. Uh, now, in Job, we're nearing the end. And uh, it's, been, it's been really... Uh, interesting exciting studying this book but uh when we finish job i do have other plans i i believe we'll be going on to the book of ecclesiastes to look at that one next um i also i i believe that i've completed the study on early church history uh, i just wanted to go through the first complete the first uh three centuries um uh, i mean the first four centuries uh, and and so I'm going to consider that to be done, but I'm also picking up uh, addressing in the early church the heresies that crept in. So I'll, I'll be looking at early church heresies uh, now that we've completed the, the study of an overview, really, of, of early church history. Uh, of course, we're also studying the book of John, the book of Proverbs, and Christian creeds. So uh, join me join me nightly at uh, 7 p.m. Pacific time for uh, all these different studies that we're doing. Uh, now I'm going to go uh, Job chapter 39. I, I'm a KJV firstist, so I'll read it first in the KJV, and then I'll look at in the Amplified. Sometimes the Amplified is helpful to me. Okay. Uh, the, the title I see in the Amplified, by the way, is that they do put a title for each chapter. It says, God Speaks of Nature and Its Beings. So as we read chapter 39, let's see if the Amplified is uh, titled it appropriately. It says, Knowest thou the time? This is God speaking. Again, in chapter 38 it was when God decided to finally intervene in this uh, drama between Job and his First, his three friends, and then the, the fourth one, Elihu, that came in, and they're all lecturing Job and condemning him and saying all these problems are your own fault because you're wicked and God's punishing you and you need to repent and maybe God will will bless you again. And But uh, Job all along, along has been maintained his innocence and thinks that uh, it's it's unjust what's happening to him because he's an innocent man so chapter 38 was uh job uh, god finally telling job uh and basically look look at what i've done in creation look particularly brother evan and nephilim free he joined me last time it was a great help showing me that there's many verses in chapter 38 that reference in creation and particularly the uh, the Noahic flood. And so that was very fascinating. But uh, so now in chapter 39, God's continuing his uh, lecture of Job. He says, God is speaking, Knowest thou the time when the wild goats of the rock bring forth? Or canst thou mark when the hinds do calve? What he's done in chapter 38 and now continuing in chapter 39 is, is giving Job perspective on Look, I'm God, uh, and you're not. You're a mere man, and uh, uh, do you really think you can understand me? Look, look, 
look what I've created. Look how I'm, uh, I, can, I can move and act on, on uh, nature and, and all my creation anytime I want. And you're just a mere man. So keep that in perspective, Job. So it says, Knowest thou the time when the wild goats of the rock bring forth? Or canst thou mark when the hinds do calf? In the Amplified it says, Do you know the time when the wild goats of the rock give birth to their young? Do you observe the calving of the deer? Of course, all the questions that God is asking Job, Job has to answer no to all the questions. He doesn't know these things. He's not capable. Only God is omniscient. Only God is omnipotent. Only God is omnipresent. And Job is, uh, you know, he's just a finite uh, mortal man. Verse 2. Canst thou number the months that they fulfill? Or knowest thou the time when they bring forth? Uh, in the Amplified it says, Can you count the months that they carry offspring? Or do you know the time when they give birth? Well, I'm, if Job had taken the time to watch the calves and the wild goats and study it out, perhaps he could have learned that, but he doesn't know it. He, he's not omniscient. Uh, he, he, he doesn't, uh, there's, there's, he knows almost nothing because, I mean, you can be the wisest man in the world. Uh, one thing that struck me years ago, I read a quote from Einstein. And Einstein is considered to be one of the smartest people in history. Uh, he, he discovered or came up with the theory of relativity. Uh, I'm sure there's, I don't know a whole lot about physics and science and, and the, you know, from the, the kind of science that uh, Einstein, uh, you know, thought about and taught, but He's really admired as one of the most brilliant scientists in history. And, but Einstein, as smart as he was, he says that man, all of man, no, not one man, we do not, we do not know 1% of nothing. And, you know, we've learned a lot more since Einstein's time, but now we still don't even know 1% of nothing. Yeah, of everything there is to know, and that's what God knows. God knows everything there is to know. And what we know, everything we've learned, all of our conceit and arrogance and, and um, uh, pride that man has, thinking he's come so far and he's, man is all of that, you know. And yet, we don't even know 1% of nothing. So Job has to... He hasn't answered the questions, but that it's, it's a rhetorical question. Job, do you know this? Do you know this? Do you know this? We know that Job has to answer the question. No, he doesn't. Uh, verse 3. They bow themselves or bow. It's B-O-W. I'm not sure. They bow themselves. They bring forth their young ones. They cast out their sorrows. The Amplified says, they kneel down, they bring forth their young, they cast out their labor pains. Okay. Well, I'm glad I read that in the Amplified because they cast out their sorrows. I would not have connected that to labor pains, but that's the only way it does make sense to me. So God said, do you know, about the wild goats uh, and, the, and the calves and their births and 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 how they are they're giving birth and they bow down. He's just giving him a, a, an example of many examples he gives him of what God Job does not know. Verse four: Their young ones are in good liking; they grow up with corn; they go forth and return not unto them. Who hath sent out the wild ass free? Or who hath loosed the bands of the wild ass? Let me look at that in the Amplified. It says, who sent out the wild donkey free from dependence on man? Hmm. And who has loosed the bonds of the wild donkey to survive in the wild? Yeah. 
the donkey, of course, is a it's a beast of burden. Man, man has taken the donkey and other animals, and we've made them beasts of burden. We put them under our control, a kind of like slavery, and they're not free. We will feed them, take care of them enough to keep them alive and strong, so they can they can work. And so he's saying here that when they're set free, they're capable of taking care of themselves. He says, uh, who sent out the don donkey free from dependence on man? Who has loosed the bonds of the wild donkey to survive in the world? Uh, let's look at verse 6 in the KJV. Who, whose house I have made the wilderness and the barren land his dwelling? And the Amplifier says, to whom I gave the wilderness as his home and the salt land as his dwelling place. I think he's still referencing the, the wild ass or the, yeah, the wild ass or the donkey. Um, verse eight, verse, no, verse seven. He scorneth the multitude of the city, neither regardeth he the crying of the driver. Okay, and the, Amplified, it says, he scorns the tumult of the city and does not hear the shouting of the taskmaster. So the donkey's been set free. So he's not under the taskmaster any longer. He doesn't have to listen to the, his master ordering him and making him work as a beast of burden. Verse 8, the range of the mountains is his pasture, and he searcheth after every green thing. Will the unicorn be willing to serve thee? or abide by thy crib? Now this is an interesting verse here. Will the unicorn be willing to serve thee, or abide by thy crib? Now, of course, the question is, is this unicorn a mythical creature that never existed? Is it a creature that is, that uh, uh, as we understand it, most people think a unicorn is a horse with a horn on its head, a single horn, uh, kind of like an antelope has horns, but it's a singular horn. So unicorn means one horn. And uh, we know that there are some animals that do have one horn, you know, for example, a rhinoceros. I know some rhinoceroses have two horns, one lower long one and one upper short one, but uh, that, and then there's others that have just one. So there are animals that would, we could call unicorns, or unicorn just means an animal that has one horn. It's sort of like a deer that has a lot of horns, or a ram that has two horns. Uh, uh, so a, a unicorn doesn't necessarily mean the, the unicorn that, that we see in you know movies and cartoons, and uh, uh, old, little books, children's books, where you have pictures of the horse with a single horn. Uh, unicorn can just mean an animal that has one horn. Now, it could be an animal that uh, is, is extinct now, that doesn't, doesn't exist anymore. It could be just a reference to any of the animals today that have a single horn. But let me see how it's phrased. Verse 9 in the... Uh, uh, verse nine is verse nine in the KJV says, "Will the unicorn be willing to serve thee?" But in verse in uh, the Amplify says, "Will the wild ox be willing to serve you, or remain beside your manger at night?" The wild ox. Uh, okay, I don't know how they come up with wild ox. I wish I could, there was an explanation. There's no footnote on that. Verse 10 in the KJV, Canst thou bind the unicorn with his band in the furrow? Or will he harrow the valleys after thee? And let's look at the Amplified. Can you bind the wild ox with a harness to the plow in the furrow? Or will he plow the valleys for you? Hmm. I want to look at this in the in another translation, just to give an idea. Let me see. Let me look at it in uh, the horrible. 
Let me see. Let's look at it in the... Uh, Young's literal translation, just see what that says. It says, verse 9 and 10, Is a ream willing to serve thee? Doth the lodge by his crib? Doth, dost thou bind a ream in a furrow? Well, I don't know what a ream is, but that's how they, the word they use rather than unicorn. Let me look at the paraphrase, the NLT. It says, Will the wild ox consent to being tamed? Will it spend the night in your stall? Can you hitch a wild ox to a plow? Will it plow a field for you? So you can see here that uh, uh, most translations are not using the word unicorn. So if the KJV is right, unicorn, then we have to assume that it's some animal that has a singular horn. Uh, but uh, for some reason, the other translations are thinking that this is a beast of burden like a wild ox. Let me see. All right, now let's go back to the KJV, uh, verse 11. Wilt thou trust him because his strength is great? Or wilt thou leave thy labor to him? Wilt thou believe him that he will bring home thy seed and gather it into thy barn? In other words, it's, it's this ox that's working and grinding the meal and giving him the seed so, so Job can fill up his barn with seed, with grain. Uh, verse 13, Gavest thou the goodly thing, wings unto the peacocks? Or wings and feathers unto the ostrich? Let me look at that in the Amplified. Verse 13, the flightless wings of the ostrich wave joyously with the pinion shackled feathers and plumage of love. Uh, that doesn't, that's nothing. Let me look at that in the... Uh, Uh, let's say the NLT again. Just to make people mad, let me look at it in the New International Version, see what it says. Uh, it refers to it in verse 9 as, the, as a wild ox. Verse 10, uh, again, in, so now it says in verse 10, can you hold it to, no, verse 11, will you rely on it? For, no, I'm sorry, I'm on verse 13. The wings of the ostrich flap joyfully, though they cannot compare with the ostrich's feathers or the stork. So these translations are not are basically just describing the wings, whereas in the KJV, it's saying that um, Gave us thou the goodly wings unto the peacocks. That makes me think it's, did, Job, did you give the peacock its wings? Or, or wings and feathers unto the ostrich? Did you give them? But the other translations are not interpreting it that way at all. Okay, so now we let's look at verse um, 15. No, verse 14 which leaveth her eggs in the earth, this is talking about the ostrich, which leaveth her eggs in the earth and warmeth them in dust and forgetteth that the foot may crush them or that the wild beast may break them. She is hardened against her young ones as though they were not hers. Her labor is in vain without fear because God hath deprived her of wisdom, neither hath he imparted to her understanding. So I think he's referencing how stupid the ostrich is. Let me see how it explains it in the Amplified. For she leaves her eggs on the ground and warms them in the dust, forgetting that a foot may crush them or that the wild beast may trample them. She treats her young cruelly as if they were not hers, though her labor is in vain because she is unconcerned for the safety of her brood. For, for God has made her forget wisdom 
and has not given her a share of understanding. So he's pointing out that, that uh, these animals are, are they're, 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 they're brutish, beasts of burden, they're birds without, that are bird brains that don't have much intelligence, they can't be compared to man, but yet he's saying, Job, can you understand these creatures? No. And then, uh, let me see. Verse 16 in KJV, she is hardened against her young ones as though they were not hers. Her labor is in vain without fear because God hath deprived her of wisdom. Neither hath he imparted to her understanding. What time she lifteth up uh, up herself on high, she scorneth the horse and his rider. Let me look at that in the Amplified. Uh, verse 18, Yet when she lifts herself on high, so swift is she that she laughs at the horse and his rider. And then in verse 19, he says, Hast thou given the horse strength? Hast thou clothed his neck with thunder? Canst thou make him afraid as a grasshopper? The glory of his nostrils is terrible. He paweth in the valley and rejoiceth in his strength. He, he goeth on to meet the armed men. He mocketh at fear and is not affrighted. Neither turneth he back from the sword. The quiver rattleth against him, the glittering spear and the shield. He swalloweth the ground with his fierceness and rage. Neither believeth he that it is the sound of the trumpet. Verse 24, I want to see that in the Amplified. With fierceness and rage, he races to devour the ground, and he does not stand still at the sound of the war trumpet. So this horse that is so powerful and courageous and can be trained and used in battle, uh, when you had foot soldiers before horses, and then when the men came into battle with their horses, it was almost like an army bringing tanks into the army. That was the advantage that they had in size and strength and power. And these horses, of course, he says that they, they're not even distracted. They're, they're focused. And they, even the, the sound of the, the trumpet of war does not distract them. 25, he said, saith among the trumpets, ha ha, and he smelleth the battle afar off, the thunder of the captains and the shouting. Doth the hawk fly by thy wisdom and stretch her wings toward the south? Doth the eagle mount up at thy command and make her nest on high? She dwelleth and abideth on the rock, upon the crag of the rock and the strong place. From thence she seeketh the prey, and her eyes behold afar off. Her young ones also suck up blood, and where the slain are, there she is. Well, that was pretty easy to understand, those last few verses in the KJV. Uh, but it, it just seems that God is, is just going on and on to show uh, the limitations of Job, and the limitations of his understanding and his ability. And, and, and he's, he's asking Job, can you do this? Can you do this? Can you do this? Can you do this? Job hasn't answered, but we know the answer. Job knows the answer. It's kind of rhetorical. You don't even have to answer it. We know the answer is, no, I can't do these things. I don't understand those things. And, but, of course, God, if he wanted to say, say it, he could say, I can do these things. I understand these things because I made all these things. So let's get the right perspective here. Uh, I'm God and you're not. Not that Job is, you know, this is important for everybody to keep in mind uh, because it's so easy to think that Job is somehow bad and being punished if you don't know the perspective of this, of this story. So that's why you really need to keep, I'd say, two things really in mind. 
One is that in chapters one and two, uh, you see these this discussion and meetings with Satan and God. And Satan starts off by saying, God, I've, I've looked around all over the world and there's not one, one good man that loves you. And he, God says, hmm, well, what about Job? So out of the whole world, he named one person and says, what about him? Have you considered Job? And I, I'm assuming that he picked Job as an example because he's probably the best that the, the man can, of mankind, the best representative for him to say, Satan, examine Job then. And, and Job is, uh, Satan is saying he only, even Job only loves you because he's so rich. He's so blessed in every way. He has health, he has a large family, he has wealth, he has respect. And, and uh, of course he loves you, you've blessed him. Take away these blessings, let me take them away. And you'll see that he doesn't, he only loves you because you blessed him. And he will no longer love you, he'll even curse you. So that's the, the foundation of the story. That you, you have to keep that in mind in all the following chapters. So because what happens to Job is it's not God making him sick and taking away his money. It's Satan. It's, it's a, a satanic attack. Um, and then it's also, it's, it's not because Job is wicked. In other words, Job's friends, they call themselves his friends. They're, they're described as his friends. But I would want, not want friends like that because here he is down and out, really sick. He's lost, his whole family's been killed and he's lost all of his wealth and he's so dejected and uh and yet his friends, instead of consoling him and encouraging him and weeping with him, all they're doing is pointing the finger and saying, look, all this is happening because you deserve it because you're wicked. So you need to repent. And then Job's answer to them is always that, no, I, 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 I'm innocent. So then they finally say, well, if if these things are happening to you and you're claiming that you're innocent, then you must be saying that God is unjust. That's what his last friend here, Elihu, concludes. But the truth is that Job is innocent and these things are not happening to him because he's wicked, but in fact, because he's so good. He's the best of all mankind. And that's why he was selected. And, and so these bad things, this is an example of bad things sometimes happen to good people. His friends, uh, they continue to uh, uh, tell him. And because the, that this has to be a result of your wickedness, because they believe that the, the principle of reaping and sowing if bad things happen to you, if you get sick, if you're poor, it's because you're wicked. It's it's you're getting what you deserve. If you're a good person and you're working really hard, you'll be successful and healthy. That's the way they thought it worked. But reaping and sowing is a principle, but not a law. There are exceptions. There are plenty of people who are good people that are doing the right things. They're not good in terms of you know righteousness to go to heaven. But relative compared to most people, there's some, some of the nicest people, the best people we know, and that's yet some bad fortune falls upon them. Some sickness or an accident or a criminal act that comes against them. A lot of bad things happen to some good people. But his, his friends, they don't understand that, uh, that, I, that concept. <laughs> they think that if something bad happens, it's because you're wicked and God's punishing you for it. So that's the that's that's really what's been going on in this entire story. And so but God is now entered this conversation and God is lecturing Job to give him perspective to say, look, he hasn't even revealed to him what's happened yet. He hasn't told him that no, I'm not punishing you because you're wicked. And, uh, and I'm not punishing you at all. It's Satan that's doing it to you. God has not revealed that to him, but God is 
and given him the perspective and say, look, keep in mind that I'm God. You're my creature. You're a creature. You're, you're, you're finite. You're mortal. You're limited. I'm infinite. I'm omnipotent. I'm omniscient. I'll go on to uh, verse chapter 40 now. Let's see. That one moved pretty quickly. Chapter 39. Um, and then this one is Job answering. Uh, the title is Job says, what can I say? Um, uh, and and then, uh, so it says in the KJV, moreover, uh, the Lord answered Job and said, shall he that contendeth with the Almighty instruct him? He that reproveth God, let him answer. Then Job answered the Lord and said, behold, I am vile. What shall I answer thee? I will lay mine hand upon my mouth. Once I have, once have I spoken, but I will not answer. Yea, twice, but I will proceed no further. Okay, I want to look at that in the Amplified, but it. Um, okay, so now instead of a lecture, we have a dialogue going on between God and Job. In the Amplified, it says, "Then the Lord said to Job." Will the fault finder contend with the Almighty? Let whom him who disputes with God answer it. So Job is under the impression that, that he's innocent and these God's punishing him, and therefore it must it seems unfair. He doesn't understand why he's being punished when he is an innocent man. That's what he's been claiming all along. And we we, I, I believe he is an innocent, righteous man because God chose him as the righteous example of mankind. And there is a previous chapter, maybe, I don't know, maybe it's like chapter 10 or 15, somewhere in there, where Job defends himself and says all the things that he has done, the good things he's done, all the kindness, all the things. And according to that, if Job's telling the truth, and we, I have no reason to not believe it, he probably is like the best person in the world. He's absolutely uh, wonderful in his love and kindness and in and, and everything. And and so uh, it, it's clear that Job um, uh, is innocent. And, and uh, so therefore, the, here's the problem. If I'm innocent, why are these things happening to me? They think that it must be God punishing him. If God's punishing me and I'm innocent, then God must be unjust. It seems unfair. So that's what this, where the conversations reach this point. It says, then Job replied to the Lord and said, behold, I am of little importance and contemptible. What can I reply to you? So after this lecture by God for two, two chapters now, 38 and 39, and uh, God giving him perspective, uh, he, 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 he didn't answer any of those questions, but he, he certainly can understand the answer to every question is, no, I can't do that. No, I don't understand that. So he's got this perspective and he answers, behold, I am of little importance and contemptible. What can I reply to you? I lay my hand on my mouth. Uh, I have spoken once, but I will not reply again. Indeed, twice I've answered, and I will add nothing further. So verse 6 in the KJV says, Then answered the Lord unto Job out of the whirlwind and said, Gird up thy loins now like a man. I will demand of thee and declare thou unto me. Wilt thou also disannul my judgment? Wilt thou condemn me that thou mayest be righteous? Hast thou an arm like God? Or canst thou thunder with a voice like him? Deck thyself now with majesty and excellency and array thyself with glory and beauty. Cast abroad the rage of thy wrath and behold every one that is proud and abase him. Look on every one that is proud and bring him low and tread down the wicked in their place. Hide them in the dust together and bind their faces in secret. Then will I confess unto thee that thine own right hand 
can save thee. Behold, now behemoth, which I made with thee, he eateth grass as an ox. Lo, his Lo now, his strength is in his loins, and his force is in the navel of his belly. He moveth his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his stones are wrapped together. His bones are as strong pieces of brass. His bones are like bars of iron. He is the chief of the ways of God. He that made, uh, made him can make his sword approach unto him. Surely the mountains bring him forth food where all the beasts of the field play. He lieth under the shady trees in the covert of the reed and fens. The shady trees cover him with their shadow. The willows of the brook compass him about. Behold, he drinketh up a river and hasteth not, but trusteth that he can draw up Jordan into his mouth. He taketh it with his eyes. His nose pierceth through snares. So uh, I, I believe much of this uh, is describing a dinosaur. And let's see if uh, the Amplified, how it phrases it. I'll read it, it again, but in the Amplified. It says, Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind, saying, now gird up your loins, prepare yourself like a man, and I will ask you, and you instruct me. Will you really annul my judgment and set it aside as void? Will you condemn me, your God, that you may appear to be righteous and justified? So he hasn't come out and said that, uh, you know, hey, God's punished me unjustly, but that's really the, the conclusion that Elihu, made listening to Job because he's saying that uh, they're all assuming that God's punishing him. God still hasn't told him that it's not me that's punished you. God did allow it though. So on one hand, you might think that, well, okay, it's, it's God's will since God allowed it. He allowed Satan to do it, but God is not doing it as a punishment for his wickedness. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, he was selected as the most righteous man and uh, so he's, if anything, he's being punished because he's righteous. And then Job uh, can't understand how this could be anything but unfair. So then he says in verse 9, Have you an arm like God? And can you thunder with a voice like his? Adorn yourself with eminence and dignity since you question the Almighty. And array yourself with honor and majesty. Pour out the overflowing of your wrath and look at everyone who is proud and make him low. Look at everyone who is proud and humble him. And if you are able, uh, so and if you are so able, tread down the wicked where they stand. So again, he's giving him perspective that no, Job cannot do these things. Only God can do all these things. Verse 13, crush and and hide them in the dust together, shut them up in the hidden place, the house of death. If you can do all this, Job, proving your divine power, then I, God, will also praise you and acknowledge that your own right hand can save you. So he's saying your right hand cannot save you. You cannot get saved through your effort. You're going to need me, Job. Now, here's the important, interesting part about that. I believe this is describing... Uh, uh, now, this is interesting. Is In the Amplified, it's referring to this as an ox. I want to look at other translations and see how they uh, respond to this behemoth. But, uh, oh no, it's not calling it an ox. I misunderstood. It says, Behold now, behemoth, which I created, as well as you, he eats grass like an ox. See now, his strength is in his loins and his power is in the muscles and sinews of his belly. Just the word behemoth means giant. We use the word behemoth to describe, a, 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 I think if you look at it outside of even looking at this creature, you think that behemoth is something that's big. You can call a, a man that's really large as a, a behemoth, very, very large. In verse 17, it says, he sways his tail like a cedar. Now, 
This could not be an elephant. He has a tiny little tail. It could not even be an alligator or crocodile because uh, even though his tails are bigger than a than an elephant's, uh, it's it's not like a cedar. No no animal today has a tail that's like a cedar, a cedar tree. And then it says the tendons of his thighs are twisted and knit together like a rope. His bones are tubes of bronze. His limbs are like bars of iron. So this is describing a creature that is huge with a tail the size of a tree. And his bones are so strong, powerful, that uh, uh, I think this is talking about uh, dinosaurs. And we do know that uh, there are people that think that Many people think that uh, dinosaurs and man did not live in the same time spans. And uh, uh, to me, it's very, very clear that man lived with dinosaurs. Dinosaurs lived with man. It's, it's obvious. We just have too many artifacts of drawings and caves and artistic things that have been made the, uh, that from ancient peoples of the dinosaurs that as we as we know them today from our archaeological digs and, and and reassembling their skeletons we know their basic size and, and structures and, and yet these drawings and these artistic you know artifacts here are uh, made by men long before we had modern archaeology to dig up all these bones it's, it's it should be obvious to anybody that uh, dinosaurs lived with men. Now, how long ago was it? I'm not sure. Uh, I tend to uh, agree with Brother Nephilim Free about the, the age of the Earth being a, the, a young Earth. Uh, maybe the creation of the universe was was uh, older. I don't. I don't really know. I'm not going to try to present that or defend one side or, or the other. But I think it's it's conclusive. It's uh, it's uh, beyond doubt that dinosaurs live with men. Obviously, here this description here in Job is just another example of describing a dinosaur. Tell me what animal today has a tail like a cedar tree. But we know that some of the dinosaurs, like Brontosaurus and maybe others, that had giant these giant tails. Uh, and then it says. He is the first in magnitude and power. In other words, he's the largest, biggest of all my creation. Uh, and he is the first in magnitude and power of the works of God. Only he who made him can bring near his sword to master him. So only God, he's God saying, only I, the one that made him. He said, verse 20, surely the mountains bring him food and all the wild animals play there. He lies down under the lotus plants and in the hidden shelter of the reeds in the marsh. The lotus plants cover him with their shade. The willows of the brook surround him. If a river rages and overflows, he does not tremble. He is confident, though the Jordan River swells and rushes against his mouth. So this is saying right at the Jordan River there is where you can find the, the behemoth. Uh, can anyone capture him when he is on watch or pierce his nose with barbs to trap him? The answer to that question is no, that's rhetorical. Let me look at the footnotes here. Uh, Job 40, 15. Uh, they're saying that it could be a, a hippopotamus, but that's to me absurd because hippopotamus has a tail, you know, smaller than my arm. It's not like the size of a cedar tree. It says, although Behemoth cannot be identified with certainty, the biblical description seems most like the hippopotamus. In ancient times, it may have been even more formidable than today. In Job's day, the hippopotamus was the largest known creature, was commonly found in the lower Nile River, and may have uh, also have existed in the Jordan. In the Jordan. Now, that doesn't, I'm not buying that at all. The hippopotamus could not possibly be the Behemoth. Um, let me see. Okay, uh, this ends that chapter, chapter 41. So I'll pick up a chapter 42 next time. I want to reserve a few minutes here 
to tell you the good news. I don't want to ever spend any time doing any Bible studies and teaching here that uh, no matter what the subject, no matter what the book of the Bible, I still need to eventually get around to this free gift. <laughs> so I want to tell you good news. There's the, the, there's a, a word in the Bible, and you've probably heard this word before, but I'm, I'm not sure you know what it means. It's, it's a Greek word. It's gospel. Gospel is Greek, and the translation is literally good news. So I want to tell you good news before we're finished tonight. And I believe, though, the translation would be better if it was great news or the greatest news ever. And so simply, the simplest way, the shortest way I can tell you is the good news is that Jesus Christ is offering all of us, every single person, a free gift. The gift is eternal life in heaven. <laughs> Think of it. Eternal life in heaven offered to you as a free gift from Jesus Christ. That's good news. That's the greatest news ever. Now, I want to tell you how this came about and why, you know, why this is true. See, first of all, if you're not familiar with what I call biblical Christianity, the type of Christianity that we find in the Bible. If you're not familiar with it, then you probably, have, this is, is totally foreign to you. You're probably absolutely surprised. I'm telling you, you're saying, Brother Luke, you're saying that I get to go to heaven as a free gift from Jesus? Uh, yes, that's what I'm saying. That's what the Bible says. That's what Christianity is. Uh, a Christian is simply a person that is relying completely on Jesus Christ for their salvation. And But uh, the problem is almost all the churches in America today, you know, all the churches around the world, in fact, all the religions of the world today and all throughout history, they've all been lying to you. And this is a lie from the devil. And the lie is that if you want to go to heaven, you have to work for it and earn it. The people that go to heaven are the really good people that were real religious and really good. And the people who were not good enough, they end up in hell. That's a lie from the devil. But that's, that's the philosophy of the world today. That's the philosophy uh, throughout all of the history of man. People have been striving to get to heaven by joining religions and becoming religious. But I want you to know that that is impossible because the Bible says that all of us have sinned. There's no exceptions. It, say, it says, if the, you say you have no sin, you deceive yourself and the truth is not in you. Now, I know that some people sin a lot. And some sin people sin less. It's not the number of sins that matters. And, and, and some people have sins that you might think, well, that's a lot worse than my sins. But it's not the type of sin that matters either. The fact is that if you've sinned one time, then you cannot go before God and say, I've been perfect my whole life. But that's what you have to do. If you want to plead your case to God and say, I deserve heaven because I'm a good person, the standard you have to meet is perfection. That's what we learn in the Bible. That's what Jesus taught. That's what the, the apostles taught. Perfection. But we can't reach perfection because the Bible says that we all fall short of the glory of God. See, let's say this level is the glory of God, perfection. This is what Jesus Christ did. Jesus lived a sinless, perfect life. He is the glory of God. He set the standard. So you have to be as good as Jesus. Now, you join all the religions of the world, and you work and strive, and you'll never reach that. You'll always fall short. You can never be perfect and say to God, I'm perfect. Now I can come into heaven, right? No. So that's the first thing you understand, is that it's impossible. And that's why the apostles asked Jesus, he said, well, then how is it possible for anyone to be saved? And Jesus said, that's right. With man, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So you can get to heaven 
if you're trusting God, but if you're trying to get there through your own efforts, it's impossible. But the God in the Bible who saves you is Jesus Christ. He, he is God who became a man. And why did Jesus become a man? Why did God become a man named Jesus Christ? Jesus said that he came down from heaven and he became a man so that he could give his life as a ransom. And that's what he did. He, Jesus Christ, died on a cross. He bled, he suffered, and he died on the cross to pay for your sins and for mine. The Bible says that God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So that, that means that God demonstrated how much he loved us by doing this. Even though we're all sinners, he was willing to die for us. What happened on that cross was miraculous. All the sins of every person who's ever lived was put on Jesus Christ. The Bible says that, uh, that uh, he became sin for us. So much sin was on him that he just, it seemed like he was sin. He was so covered with all of our sins, the sins of all men throughout all history. Jesus suffered and paid for it all. So the good news is Jesus paid for our sins. And he died and he was buried. But Jesus said in his ministry, when they demanded a sign, he claimed he was God and Savior. And they said, well, give us a sign to prove it. He said, the sign I'll give you is my death, burial, and resurrection. He said, he said uh, just as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in, I'm, in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. That was analogous to his death, burial, and resurrection. He predicted that after he died, he would be raised back to life bodily. And that's what happened. On the third day, he rose from the grave bodily. And then he walked on the earth for 40 days among 500 witnesses. They saw him. They talked to him. They touched him. They ate with him. And it's the resurrection of Jesus Christ that proves that his claims were true, that he is God and Savior, and he has power over life and death. And Jesus says that he will give us life everlasting if we'll trust him. Stop trying to get to heaven some other way. Give up on that and instead rely on Jesus. Now, let me use this as an illustration here. You see this picture here? Jesus wants to take you to heaven. Bible says, God doesn't desire that any of us should perish. He wants to take you to heaven. If you want to go there, then reach out to him in faith. Say, I'm trusting you, Jesus. I'm depending on you. And then he says that no one can pluck you out of my hand. He says, I will never leave you or forsake you. He, it, that's, a, that's a promise from God. And because God made the promise, it's a guarantee. And that's why I can, I can boast in Jesus Christ. I will not boast about myself. No, I, I'll just say I don't deserve it, but thank you, Jesus, because Jesus, our great Savior God, he's guaranteed me I'm going to go to heaven because I trusted him. So you understand now why this is called the good news? The good news that salvation, eternal life in heaven is a free gift from Jesus if you just trust him. Put your faith in Jesus now. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you learned something. I hope you join me nightly, 7 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, we're studying the book of Job, the book of Proverbs, the book of John, uh, we just completed early church history, so next we'll go into early church heresies. Uh, we're looking at Christian creeds, so uh, it's just fascinating. I'm having a great time studying and teaching these, so please join me nightly, 7 p.m. Pacific time. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.